Well, um, uh, one thing I would like to mention uh, before I start that I am now at uh, full screen mode. So I'll not be able to see any text or any chat. So if there is anything, please go ahead and interrupt me if you, if you, if you would like. Yes. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah. And um, yeah, my name is Nasser. I am from uh, Oman and uh, I am associate professor at the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at Sultan Qaboos University. And meanwhile, I'm also serving as the assistant dean for postgraduate studies and research. And uh, today, uh, this is my first time basically to join a training course in India. And I am very glad to be with you today. So uh, today I'm going to talk about heat pumps, principles and applications. So if you are going to see the picture of my presentation is mostly um, uh, basically it goes to the science side and then I'll try to walk you in to the application side. And later we can discuss about uh, these topics and their relevance to the industry. And of course, uh, today I have with me my friend, Dr. Ramaswamy, who is the expert here in the industrial applications. So um, before I start, I would like to walk you in from the- so, uh, very Thank you, Professor Doctor. Dr. Nasser, Welcome. just one minute, I will uh, tell my to my engineers. Good afternoon, uh, my engineers. Thank you. Professor Dr. Nasser and myself, uh, we have been doing research uh, for the last five years. Uh, and uh, he is one of the best academicians I have ever seen. We have conducted some course uh, here in Oman uh, as a community service uh, two years ago. And that was uh, very well uh, received by uh, the people who are practicing engineers in Oman and practicing te technicians. Uh, one is through the Sudan Kapus University itself. It was in 2016 or 17. And then 2019 also we have conducted for the defense personnel actually in that. So, uh, so I know uh, Nasser is uh, one of the best thermal engineer I know. We are also doing some research project on the organic Rangin cycle now. And uh, I'm sure uh, his uh, presence in this uh, heat pump and will be very interesting, very useful to you. And I also, first time, uh, he's also interacting with our Indian engineers. And it's also special, on my special invitation, he, he has accepted my invitation. I hope, and uh, whatever the further timing, maybe another one and a half hours, what he's going to spend, it will be useful to all the engineers. And my best wishes for the great session, and I'll be also on the line. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasser. Sorry. I interfered in that. Thank you very much. You can go ahead. You're welcome. You're welcome, Dr. Rama. Thank you very much. So um, no, no, starting with the very basics, um, we, if we look at the basically the forms of energy, we have two forms, which are basically work and heat. And when it comes to the conversion of energy, we can basically convert, convert, uh, uh, convert work to work or work to heat. And also we have heat to work. And we have heat to heat. Of course, when we look at work to work, it's just like, for example, we, for example, we have two gears that goes work from one gear, it goes to the other one. We have work to heat. Work to heat is usually the heat that accompanies uh, work. And this is like, for instance, friction. In friction, we have part of the work being exerted will be converted into heat. And also we have heat to work and heat to heat. Now, when it comes to heat to heat, also we have two sides. We have heat from high temperature medium to low temperature medium. And we have heat from low temperature medium to high temperature medium. Now, what we are interested in more in thermodynamics are these two, heat to work and heat from low temperature medium to high temperature medium. We call these two heat from high temperature medium to low temperature medium and work to heat. These two processes are spontaneous. Spontaneous, we don't have to interfere. They happen by themselves. So if there is some work that's being done 
friction will be caused naturally. So that's going to be a spontaneous process. And likewise, if we just have non-restricted heat at high temperature, then it is going to flow to low temperature. Now, what we want to do, we need to reverse these two uh, phenomena. And so we have number one, we have the conversion from heat to work and the flow of heat from low temperature to high temperature. In this case, the process is not spontaneous. We need to have special devices. And usually if we are going to convert heat to work, then we have what we call theoretically heat engine. <clears throat> and like for instance, we have the car engine. The car engine is basically a heat engine and its purpose is to reverse the spontaneous process. That means I need to convert heat into work. So I need to burn some fuel to get some motion, to get basically some rotation. Our course today or our training today is going to be on the second spontaneous process, which is basically the transfer of heat from low temperature medium to high temperature uh, medium. And that is what exactly we do in air conditioning. We need to remove heat from the inside of the room, which is in the 20s, for instance, degree C, and we need to take it to the outside, which is in the 30s or the 40s degree C, like in our region. Now, these two processes, like I said, this process, process number one, where we need to convert heat to work, we call it heat engine, and where we need to convert uh, or, or transfer heat from low temperature to high temperature, we call it heat pump. So heat pump is something different from a heater. When I say a heater, a heater is basically uh, a device that has a source of heat to be removed from high temperature to low temperature. So in the heater, usually we produce high temperature medium that and the heat then it's going to flow by itself spontaneously from that device to the outside. While when it comes to the heat pump, I need to do some uh, basically uh, saving and I don't want to use electricity to basically produce heat through a resistance. No, but I need to have a cycle and that cycle will allow me to transfer the heat from low temperature to high temperature. This difference between the heater and the heat pump is basically what we are going to shed light on more when we talk about dual heat pumps. Dual heat pumps is basically, they use both concepts. They use the concept of the transfer of heat from low temperature to high temperature using this special device called heat pump and using an electrical heater or a primary fuel heater like a, a heater that's based on uh, uh, propane gas, for instance. So this is very important in order to understand uh, basically the, the, the difference between these two. And also when we understand these principles, th that basically will make it much easier for us to troubleshoot any problems or basically to design a system and knowing the available uh, basically possibilities for that design. So second law of thermodynamics is basically about reversing spontaneous processes. We have two spontaneous processes to go very quick is that heat transfer from high temperature to low temperature. I reverse it by allowing it to transfer from low temperature to high temperature using a heat pump. Second spontaneous process, which is not relevant today, which is basically the conversion of heat into work like what we do in the car engine. So when I say a heat pump, this is the conceptual name, but it covers both application, the air conditioner, as well as the heat pump or what is being known in the industry as heat pump and air conditioner, because both cycles work on the same principle, except that the reverse direction of flow. So that is a very quick concept, uh, thermodynamic concepts on the difference between a heat pump and a heater or a furnace. So before we talk about the cycle, we also need to understand basically a uh, phase change. Now, for a pure substance that exists in a solid state, if we need to change the phase of this substance, then we need to add an amount of heat. And that amount of heat is going to cause heating until it starts melting. Melting is basically the conversion of solid to liquid. And when we have a pure substance, then melting will take place at constant temperature. 
And again, when everything basically melts and we keep increasing the temperature or providing heat, then in that case, of course, the temperature is going to increase again until we reach the basically the uh, 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 evaporation temperature. And at that point or the boiling point, and at that point, the liquid is going to be converted into gas. And again, the temperature is going to stay constant. And then uh, until I have everything evaporated, then again, I will have heating. And so the process here is basically heating and heating. So here I have heating of solid. Here I have heating of, uh, of, of liquid. This process where I have the conversion of solid into liquid, I have melting. And here I have the two processes that are relevant here, which is the conversion of liquid into gas, which is vaporization and gas into liquid, which is condensation. And we always like to transfer heat at constant temperature and constant pressure because that, of course, will provide uh, more stability to our system, especially when we deal with a small system. And at that point, we will be able to basically transfer so much heat while keeping the temperature and pressure constant. So that's going to be, of course, will make the control of the process uh, much easier. So our cooling process, when we talk about air conditioner, is going basically to have a cycle. And that cycle is going to switch between condensation and vaporization of the, um, of, of the ferion or the working fluid. And, and at that point, at that phase change, heat will be transferred between my medium of interest. Like, for instance, in cooling, my medium of interest is going to be my room and the outside, and the outside in that case, of course, is going to be the outside atmosphere. So these two processes, the heat transfer processes, are going to take place at almost constant pressure and constant temperature for the ferion. And that's why we need to like to have phase change. Why do I care about this? Because again, later I'm going to talk about the selection of the refrigerant. And the selection of the refrigerant, one of the criteria is that I need to look at the pressure at which phase will change at the required temperature. So when we talk about uh, basically uh, phase change at a given pressure, this is very important, phase change changes at a constant temperature. This is for pure substances. So I have one to one relationship for one pressure. I have one temperature at which phase will change and the other, the other way around at a given temperature phase will change at a given uh, uh, pressure. Second, during isothermal phase change, the substance either absorbs heat when the phase change goes from liquid to gas or from solid to liquid or liquid to gas and releases heat when the process goes or the phase change goes from gas to liquid or liquid to solid. Now, or uh, basically, uh, yeah, from gas to liquid. So here I need basically to release heat when I go when I go from gas to liquid. And of course, when I go from gas to liquid, usually when we have gas, we have high energy level. And the energy level is going to decrease with the liquid until it goes to its lowest when we have solid. So here we need to give up uh, heat. So inside the room, I should understand that I need to absorb heat from the room into the Refrigerant. That means inside the room, I'm going to have conversion from liquid to gas because I am providing heat to the refrigerant. I am giving energy to the refrigerant. And it works the other way around at the condenser side. I am giving heat to the outside. So at that point, I have in the condenser, I have conversion from gas to liquid. Sorry about this. Uh, this might be a little bit boring for some of you who already graduated from uh, the, the school or the industry, but I prefer to go this way. I go step by step because usually in this kind of courses, we have a pool of uh, uh, audience and some of them basically have uh, disconnected from, the, from, from, from science for a long time. But just bear with me for a few slides until I get to the second. So, then we have also the evaporation. Evaporation is basically a phase change process in which liquid absorbs heat to change uh, to gas. And when I talk about air conditioning, evaporation is the process that takes place inside the room 
And here, because heat is absorbed from the surrounding, the surrounding experiences heat loss and hence will get cooler. Now, the evaporation of a substance will lead the surrounding to cool down. So now I need to devise a process with a refrigerant that will go inside the room, will get heated, and the way it heats will lead it to be converted from liquid into vapor. And the only thing, and the only way for that to happen is by absorbing heat from the surrounding. Remember that heat is absorbed from the surrounding spontaneously. Here, I'm not talking about, about the fan, I'm talking about the heat flow from the surrounding into the refrigerant. So I don't have any heating uh, element in this case, it's just that I allow the fluid to flow inside the room. And with that flow, it is going to convert uh, basically from liquid or from liquid uh, vapor mixture into vapor spontaneously by absorbing the heat from the surrounding. What happens in this case, as I mentioned, we have an evaporation process. Of course, we always, why, why do I call it evaporator? We have evaporator and also sometimes I have the same process where I have the conversion from liquid side to gaseous side. I also have boiling. So I might have a boiler. This is basically the engineering convention. When I have evaporator, then that means I don't have any heating element for this phase change. That means the process is spontaneous. I have the heat goes from the medium, from the high temperature to the low temperature spontaneously. So that's, I call it evaporator. But when I have a boiler, then that means I have a furnace. I, heat, I have a source of heat. The conversion is not spontaneous within that component. So whenever I have phase change that goes from the liquid side to the gas side, the only way for this to happen is that I need to provide heat. And we can experience that, for instance, uh, when, when we have a shower, even if we are taking a hot shower, we still feel very cold as we go from the shower to the outside. Why is that? Because the, uh, the, the, the water surface we have or the wood surface on our body is going to evaporate, it's going to change phase. And that change of phase, like I said, requires some heat to be removed and that heat is going to be removed from our bodies. So here it doesn't have to do, has nothing to do with the, with the temperature of the water or the temperature of the wetness we have on our body, but it has to do with the phase change. When we have a phase change, there is no change in the uh, temperature of the liquid, but we need to absorb temperature or we need to absorb heat from the surrounding. And that's why we feel it cold. And also we have the sweating process, which is of course a natural cooling process that we basically produce sweat so that our bodies are going to be cooled down because when that sweat basically evaporates, it's going to take heat out of our bodies. Now, with this, uh, we, we get to the, uh, the, the, uh, the principle of science here. And I call this slide, I usually tell my students, this is the golden slide. You need to understand this slide from the very beginning when we talk about air conditioning. For a pure substance, we have a one-to-one -one relationship between pressure and temperature, saturation pressure and saturation temperature. So here I have low temperature and high pressure. Here I have the liquid side and here I have the gas side. So there is no way for me to change phase between liquid to gas without passing through this line. So if for instance, I am talking about 100 atmospheric pressure, there is no way I can change from any point at this pressure without passing by the phase change temperature. And this is basically the point upon which the principle of air conditioning basically uh, uh, revolves. What I need to do, I need to allow phase change at almost atmospheric condition. What happens in that case, the temperature has to drop down to the boiling point at the evaporator pressure. And this has more to do with the selection, the selection of the refrigerant. So I know that when I select a refrigerant, 
I need to go and check this curve. The curve I am showing here is for water, but we have similar curves for refrigerants. So I need to make sure that the refrigerant will have the desired boiling point at the evaporator pressure. And again, I need to make sure that at the condenser pressure, I have a boiling point that is suitable enough to allow transfer of heat from the condenser to the outside. This is extremely important because like I said, now I am going to go back to the slide uh, every once and again, because we need to check the pressure as basically, or, or we need to check the boiling point at a given pressure value. So th this is basically the pressure versus, versus temperature curve. And also we have the temperature versus specific volume. Specific volume is the inverse of the density. And so if you look at these lines, these pink lines, these are basically the constant pressure lines. And if you want to move from any point to any point, you can always think whether you need to absorb heat from the surrounding or you, if you need to give heat to the surrounding. And so here we have, for instance, the atmospheric pressure or almost atmospheric pressure. And here we have below atmospheric pressure and here we have high pressure. So if, for instance, we have a pressurized substance that's being expanded, and I'm going to talk about expansion, I basically have pressurized substance inside a cylinder, I open the valve, then the expansion process is to, going to take place until it gets to the atmospheric pressure. But if I know that at this given temperature, let's say, for instance, that the temperature here is uh, a given X temperature, and this is the atmospheric temperature, and for the gas to go back again in equilibrium with the atmosphere, then the only way for it is that it changes phase and it goes back. And for it to have, for this to happen, it has to absorb heat from the surrounding. And that is exactly what happens inside the evaporator. Inside the evaporator, we allow expansion. And with the expansion, heat is going to be taken from the inside of the room to be carried away by the refrigerant. That's my working fluid, which will carry it again back to the, uh, basically to the, uh, 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 to, to the gaseous phase. So in this curve, which we call, of course, the TV curve, at each pressure, there is one boiling point. And you can see here at each curve, I'm, look, I'm talking about the horizontal segments. Each horizontal segment, horizontal segment corresponds to a given temperature value until I get to a point, and this is called the critical point. At the critical point, there is the phase will change basically in a split second. We cannot even feel there is a phase change. So also, again, I go back here to the selection of the refrigerant. We always should make sure that our refrigerant has a critical point that is high enough away from the operational range. So if my operational range, for instance, goes between minus 17 degrees C to let's say 40 degrees C, I need to make sure that the critical temperature is much higher than 40 degrees C in order to avoid basically, basically having supercritical, uh, basic, uh, supercritical uh, uh, phase. And I need to make sure that my operation is going to be between these two basically uh, uh, subcritical uh, pressure values. Um, other observation we see here that the boiling point and hence phase change is reached by heating liquid and we have the temperature increase in the liquid phase until it reaches boiling. And this is the segment where we basically heat the liquid, then the temperature stays constant at boiling point. And here is the horizontal line. And here is exactly the process that takes place inside the evaporator and inside the, uh, the, the condenser as well, phase change. So we have no temperature change and then we have heating. So here we have after phase change, temperature starts increasing again with the addition of the extra heat. So th these are basically the, 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 what we need to understand about these diagrams. And these diagrams are very important. This will always tell me whether I need to provide heat or to extract heat from the system as it goes from one point in this TV diagram to another point. 
So at a given pressure, there is one boiling point temperature that we need to keep in mind. And also at a given temperature, there is only one vapor pressure at which phase is changed. And we call this, we call the relationship for a pure substance between boiling temperature and saturation pressure, we call it one-to-one -one relationship. So the relationship between boiling point and vapor pressure is proportional. If one also increases, the other one has to increase. So we should expect that when the pressure is high, then the boiling point is going to be higher. And that's why we always talk about boiling in the mountain takes time because on top of the mountain, the atmospheric pressure is basically lower. And that means the boiling point is also lower. So the, the cooking, for instance, takes time because it's going to take place at a lower temperature uh, compared to what we experience as sea level, at sea level. So how can a liquid substance reach its boiling point? This is what we are trying to do. We are trying to perform some cooling. So that means we are trying to allow boiling to take place at the evaporator pressure. And this is by increasing its temperature at a constant pressure until boiling, boiling point is reached, or by decreasing pressure to a, to a value that corresponds to vapor pressure of the surrounding temperature. And this is exactly what happens inside the air conditioner is that we pressurize the refrigerant and then we allow its pressure to drop. And with that, of course, we have to experience phase change. This might be a little bit tricky at this point because now I am giving you some scattered information, but now I am going to collect all of these pieces into basically uh, one concept. So this is one thing we need to understand between boiling temperature and saturation pressure. And second, we need to understand the expansion process. The expansion process is basically the process in which the pressure of a liquid substance at a given temperature is decreased until it, until it reaches the vapor pressure of the given temperature. So basically what we have here is basically we have some pressurized liquid with decrease its pressure until we get to the boiling point. That means we have some phase change. After expansion, vaporization and heat change will take place automatically. Why is that? Because we can do this by aligning the boiling point, so that means if I have P equals, let's say, three atmospheric pressure, and at one atmospheric pressure, I have the boiling point being, let's say, minus 20 degrees C. So what I can do here, I basically allow the expansion process to start from three atmospheric pressure until one atmospheric pressure. What happens at one atmospheric pressure? I will have the boiling point being minus 20 degrees C, but if my surrounding is higher than minus 20 degrees C, let's say 25 degrees C, then of course, in that case, heat is going to be taken from the surrounding into the, uh, from the surrounding into the uh, refrigerant. And so that heat is going to be absorbed spontaneously. What will happen to the refrigerant? The refrigerant is basically going to boil. It's going to boil at that low temperature until it's been converted into gas. And then the compression process will start in my AC in order to complete the cycle. So with vaporization, heat would be absorbed from the surrounding and that is what we are trying to reach. So expansion of pressurized, pressurized gas can be simply by releasing the gas through a valve. The valve you have, let's say for instance, you have a cylinder of nitrogen the valve you have can act as an expansion valve because what happens here, let's say for instance that you have the nitrogen being compressed at five atmospheric pressure or even higher. You open the valve, you drop it down to one atmospheric pressure. What happens in this case? The nitrogen is going to be released from five atmospheric, atmospheric pressure to one atmospheric pressure. Then here I'm going to experience an expansion process. And if you ever have been seeing propane gas or cooking gas being opened, you will see that there is some frost 
that will be surrounding the valve. That frost is because of this expansion process, because uh, propane, for instance, at atmospheric condition, or the cooking gas at atmospheric condition, usually it's being gaseous, but because it is pressurized and liquid inside, it needs to go back to gas at one atmospheric pressure. And for this phase change to take place, it has to first drop down to the boiling point. And the boiling point for nitrogen, for instance, at one atmospheric pressure is, a little, uh, is uh, around minus 196 degrees C. So that's why we always see that frost surrounding the uh, 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 nitrogen gas or nitrogen cylinder valves. So when the valve opens, the pressure decreases or expands to atmospheric pressure, if I have that pressurized gas. If the atmospheric temperature is higher than the gas boiling point at the atmospheric pressure, then in that case, of course, I will experience phase change. There will be some phase change that's going to take place. And so in that case, uh, uh, the, the nitrogen gas or the pressurized gas is going to change from the liquid phase to the gases phase. And so heat is going to be absorbed from the surrounding into the gas. So let's look at here, um, what happens if a pressurized liquefied uh, petroleum gas whose normal point is 20 degrees C is expanded to atmospheric pressure. So what I have here, I have some pressurized liquid petroleum gas. And initially, let's say, for instance, uh, 10 megabars, uh, 10 uh, atmospheric pressure, very high pressure. Of course, initially, as it is inside the cylinder, its temperature will be in equilibrium with the surrounding. Let's say, for instance, that the surrounding is at 30 degrees C. Then it is going to stay at 30 degrees C initially. Now, what happens if I open this valve? Now, in this case, this valve is going to acts as an expansion valve. So the, the, the gas here is going to be taken from 10 atmospheric pressure to one atmospheric pressure. And we have the boiling point here being minus 20 degrees C. And since this gas naturally at one atmospheric pressure and 30 degrees C, it is gaseous, then it needs to go back to gaseous form. And it cannot just switch from liquid at 10 atmospheric pressure to gas at 25 degrees C and one atmospheric pressure just without passing through the boiling point temperature. So it has to first go through this temperature, it changes phase, and then the temperature will increase again to 25. This is amazing because this is the principle of air conditioning, is that there is no way for me to change phase between 10 atmospheric pressure and liquid to one atmospheric pressure and gas without passing by this landing, by passing this station, the phase change station. And this is why I was saying that for each pressure value, there is only one boiling point value. And in this case, for the one atmospheric pressure, I have minus 20 degrees C. So there is no way for this gas to change phase without passing by this station or by this landing. Now, when it goes to, when I open the valve, the temperature will drop immediately to minus 20. Why? Because it needs to change phase. And once it reaches minus 20 and all of it being gaseous, then it's going to increase in temperature until it goes back to 30 degrees C here. Sorry, it should be 30 degrees C, which is the surrounding I have in this case. So what happens for this phase to change? I, it, it needs to absorb heat. Where would that heat be absorbed from? It's going to be absorbed from the surrounding. Hence, the surrounding will be cooled because of this phase change process. So if I want to imagine the same thing on the BV diagram here. So initially, let's say, for instance, I have, or well, let me just draw uh, another one, it's already crowded, and I cannot, uh, unfortunately, uh, delete it. So initially, I have the TV diagram like this. Initially, I was 
for the gas was at, let's say, high pressure. It was in the liquid phase. I need to bring it down to one atmospheric pressure. So initially I was here. So here is liquid, here is phase change. So here I have liquid plus vapor and here I have vapor. Here's my phase change segment. I have constant temperature. So I started from this point, which was, as I said, 30 degrees C. This is how it is inside the cylinder. It is being liquefied. So under higher pressure, it is 30 degrees C. But when I look at the one atmospheric pressure, at 30 degrees C, I have vapor. When I open the valve, it's not going to jump immediately from point A to point B. No, it first has to go to my phase change phase. So it has to drop, here is expansion. With expansion, it's going to drop down to this phase change at one atmospheric pressure. And as I said, this is minus 20 degrees C. So it's going to drop to minus 20 degrees C. It absorbs heat from the surrounding to change phase. And then it will go back again to 30 degrees C at point P. And there it is in equilibrium with the surrounding. This is exactly what happens with the uh, with, with the cooking gas, for instance, if you just open the valve uh, when you don't have any by basically leading to any cooker, you just open the valve into the atmosphere. You will see frost surrounding the valve because of this phenomena is that I need to go down to the phase change, uh, basically um, uh, to, to the phase, phase change uh, temperature value. Now, let's take this example here at atmospheric pressure. Nitrogen boiling point is minus 196 or minus 195.8. This is extremely low temperature. And that's why we don't see nitrogen being used for cooling uh, unless in some laboratory and some industrial, uh, basically uh, cryogenic processes where we need to have extremely low temperature. So what happens to pressurized liquid nitrogen when it's released to the atmospheric temperature? In this case, if I just open the nitrogen, then I will immediately see this frost. Why is that? Because like I said, the temperature drops down to minus 196. And so uh, the water vapor in the surrounding, of course, is going to basically freeze uh, on the nitrogen cylinder. And what if we pressurized, what if we pressurized it again and released it? So that means I need to repeat the process over and over. That means I need to take the nitrogen, pressurized nitrogen, and then I open the gas, I open the valve, so it's going to change phase, it's going to absorb heat. Then if I pressurize that nitrogen back into my cylinder, and then I open the valve again, over and over, what will happen? What will happen in this case? In this case, the surrounding is going to be cooled down. And if my surrounding, like for instance, if I have a room and the, the room is well insulated, then if I keep repeating this process, at some point, the temperature inside the room is going to drop down to minus 196. And that's exactly what happens in the air conditioning process. In the air conditioning process, initially we have high pressure refrigerant, that's liquid, at high pressure, I have an expansion valve And the expansion process is going to drop the pressure down to the phase change point or the boiling point at the evaporator pressure. So here I have one pressure value, high pressure value, and here I have low pressure value. What happens here, I have expansion. And then I will have some cooling that means I will have phase change for the refrigerant inside the evaporator. Heat is going to be absorbed from the surrounding. And 
then I need to pressurize. I need to take that gas again back to my cylinder. Of course, here I don't have a cylinder, but I have a compressor. The compressor is going to compress the refrigerant again, and it's going to be basically compressed to high pressure, high pressure, but vapor. And I need to pressurize it to a temperature that is higher than the surrounding or the outside temperature in order for it to cool down and it goes back to high pressure in the liquid phase. So here I have the condenser. That's exactly what happens. It's just imagine that you have nitrogen cylinder, you open the valve, you experience some cooling, then just imagine yourself collecting that nitrogen from the room, pressurized it using a compressor, it goes back to the cylinder, then you relieve it again, expand it again, and you do the process over and over. This imaginary process is being controlled inside the air conditioner with its four main components. So here you have the uh, basically the compressor. You compress the refrigerant. Then it goes to high pressure in the vapor phase and high temperature, of course. Then with the surrounding, you're going to exchange heat. The heat goes to the surrounding, and that will basically make it high pressure, low temperature in the liquid phase. And then you go to the expansion process. With the expansion, you drop the pressure to low pressure. And at low pressure, you have the boiling point here, which is the desired, basically, the, the, the pressure, the, the, um, the, the refrigerant is going to change phase at the boiling point corresponding to the blow pressure. And at that point, of course, you will perform cooling. And then, of course, you will take it back again to the compressor. Of course, here, what I have here in this uh, diagram, I have like a process that can be, uh, or I have a system that can be reversed to work as a heat pump and uh, an air conditioner. And we're going to talk about that uh, basically in a while. So th this is basically up to this point, the science behind it or the physics behind the process. Uh, now we're going to talk about refrigeration, but would you like to take a break or should I just continue? We can have five minutes break. Yeah, sure. Uh, they, they want five minutes break, Professor. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So now it is uh, it is one thirty there or one. Uh, sorry, it is uh, four. Right. Thirty five. Yes. Now four and five there. Four ten. So we'll come back at four ten. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Doctor. Thank you.
Hello, Riku. Okay, uh, shall we start again? Start now, uh, Mr. Uh, Hello. Can, yes. can we start? Yes. yes, yes, you can start. Yes, please also, as, as I talk, please feel free to interrupt me because sometimes I feel that the presentation is being monotonic, just one, one, one side. Uh, one side talk. So feel, always feel free, feel free to interrupt and discuss. Okay, okay. If I have any doubt, then we can disturb you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so no, now we we'll go from the science side or the physics side to more into the uh, application side. So refrigeration as is basically um, defined by ASHRAE. It is uh, the process of extracting heat from a low temperature heat source or substance or cooling medium and transferring it to a higher temperature heat sink, which is like I said, the reverse process to this point.
transparent process. So we need to transfer heat from low temperature to high temperature medium. This is exactly what we are trying uh, to do. We go between the low temperature medium to the high temperature medium. This is what we call refrigeration. But if I go with cooling or heating, then we're talking about heat transfer by itself. But refrigeration, the term is basically about the transfer of heat from low temperature medium to the high temperature medium. And it can be used for cooling or heating. It depends on the application we have. So refrigeration systems are classified by input energy and process. And we have three common types. We have the vapor compression systems, which is basically our main focus today. We have the absorption system, and we have the gas expansion system. The vapor compression system is basically the conventional system used in domestic and most industrial uses. And here we have, as I just basically been uh, describing, we have pressurized liquid refrigerant is expanded or reduced in temperature to its boiling point at which it changes phase. So we need to bring it down to a pressure value that corresponds to the desired boiling point. And of course, after cooling, the gas phase is compressed again by the compressor, then it goes to the, the, the condenser and back again to the expansion valve. So when we talk about vapor compression system, we usually have the four components. We have evaporator, compressor, condenser, and expansion valve. And this is our basically main focus for uh, today's session. So this is basically the vapor compression system. As I said, we have the compressor, evaporator, expansion valve, and the uh, basically the evaporator. So I, I always, uh, when, when you look at the process, always connected to the TV diagram, connected to how the phase will change and what will happen to the temperature and pressure as you go from one point to another point. The second process or the second cooling process is the absorption system. Absorption system is useful when we have high heat waste. When you have some waste heat, okay. When we have some waste heat, then in that case, of course, I can use the waste heat to replace the compressor with an absorber. One bad thing about the Weber compression system is that the compressor consumes so much power consume so much energy. And so with the absorption system, I remove the compressor and basically I replace it with the absorption cycle. Absorption cycle is basically works that when I have a good uh, basically match between absorbent and absorber, like for instance, in this case, I have ammonia and water. Ammonia and water, they mix well at low pressure and low temperature. And they can be separated at high temperature. So what happens in this case is that I mix them. And instead of providing power to a compressor, I provide power to a pump. So the pump basically compress the solution to high pressure. And by using some free heat or low cost heat, like solar energy, then I, I can do the separation process. When I have this separation process, I will have liquid and gas. The liquid water is going to be released down to the absorber component, while the high pressure ammonia is going to continue the cycle to the condenser. So here I have an absorption cycle that replaces the pressure. Two important things is that this is useful when I have a source of low cost heat, that's number one. And number two is that this is useful when I need to avoid basically consuming so much energy into a compressor. And so here I am using uh, a bump. And beside this, of course, this is, uh, th this kind of cycles are high cost maintenance cycles. That's something that we need to bear in mind. 
So we mostly see such cycles in the desert, for instance, where we are far away from any uh, basically electrical source, but we have so much of solar energy, then in that case, that heat can be used in the separation process. And the second one is that we have, in this case, we have the operation in the gaseous form. An example of this is when we use the, uh, basically the cycle for the air conditioning. In this case, of course, we are basically working in the gaseous phase, and this is an, exa an example of the gas ex expansion system. Our main focus, like I said, is going to be on vapor compression system. And here we have, in the basic cycle, we have the refrigeration process is mainly based on the expansion of pressurized gases and repeating the pressurization expansion process will lead to absorbing more and more heat from the medium that you are trying to cool. And basically we dispose of that heat in the condenser side which is the outside or the basically the surrounding outside the room in the case of the cooling process. And it works the other way around when we are basically using uh, a heat pump. These are the main four components in the, uh, or the main uh, um, processes when we talk about the vapor compression uh, cycles. I don't want to repeat it, but now you understand that we go from one component into the other, I have expansion, then I have evaporation, then I have compression, and then I have condensation. These are the four processes that take place. Condensation and evaporation, these are spontaneous processes. What I need to do is just to have the coils and basically uh, a management of the temperature on both sides so that I will allow the heat flow from the room to the evaporator and from the condenser to the surrounding. So I need to be very careful about the selection of the refrigerant. I need to have refrigerants with boiling points at the given temperature at the evaporator, tem uh, at the evaporator pressure and the condenser pressure in a way that will allow that smooth transfer of heat. Expansion process takes place by using an expansion valve. And I have the compressor, which is the main component in this cycle. So this is schematic of the cycle. And we have the four components, the compressor, the condenser, the expansion valve, and the evaporator. I don't want to repeat myself. Going through this, we have the compressor used to pressurize the gas from around atmospheric pressure to three to four times the atmospheric uh, pressure. Why, need to, why do I need to do this? Because I need to complete the cycle. Always imagine the nitrogen gas cylinder that we start from pressurized liquid nitrogen, we release it to the atmosphere, we perform cooling, then we pressurize it, we bring it back again to the, uh, to the cylinder. The way to pressurize it is by using the compressor. We have the condenser at the exit of the compressor. We have high pressure, high temperature, and vapor phase. But we need to bring it down to liquid phase because we need to go through expansion process. So with that, we need to transfer heat. We need to convert it from gaseous to liquid, and we need to release heat to the outside. So we need to make sure that this high pressure will have a boiling point that is high enough compared to the surrounding. If I know that my surrounding can go up to 40 degrees C in the summertime, then I need to make sure that this pressure will have a boiling point, or this uh, refrigerant will have a boiling point that is higher than uh, basically uh, 40 degrees C so that I will have that transfer of heat from the condenser to the outside. We have the expansion valve. Here are examples of expansion valves. You can always think of the ex expansion valve as a resistance. What the resistance always going basically to drop your voltage. Our voltage here is the pressure. So this expansion valve is basically going to cause 
just like a resistance that's going to decrease the pressure. That decrease in pressure is going to bring it down to a value whose boiling point is low enough that will allow the transfer of heat from the room into the refrigerant. And hence we have the cooling process at the evaporator side. And in the evaporator side, of course, we have the inlet that comes from the expansion valve, goes through the coil. And inside these coils, I have the phase change that goes from liquid vapor mixture into almost all vapor. And that's by the transfer of the heat from the inside of the room to the evaporator. What do I need to do? This is just to have a fan. Why? Because I have the refrigerant already at a temperature that's low enough, that should be lower than the room temperature. It could be, for instance, 10 degrees C. I can select the boiling point at this pressure to be 10 degrees C. Then in that case, of course, the heat is going to transfer from the inside of the room to the evaporator. Now, with this understanding, that will help me select the right refrigerant. I need to check the boiling point of the refrigerant again at the evaporator side. This is the basic cycle on the TS diagram. On the TS diagram here, we have the entropy diagram. Of course, when I, when, when I want to look at the volume and the, uh, and the temperature and pressure, I use the TV diagram. When I need to look at losses, when I need to look at the efficiency of my cycle, then I need to look at the entropy here. I'm not going to discuss entropy if you have been uh, not so in touch with the with thermodynamics for a long time, because this is uh, basically uh, has more to do with the manufacturing side than it does with the application side. But in all cases, we have here we have phase we have compression from one to two, so compression takes place in the liquid side, and then we have condensation from high temperature, high pressure vapor into basically uh, almost liquid, high pressure, high temperature um, uh, refrigerant. Then here we have the expansion that will take it to this point. This pressure value for this refrigerant is selected such that this temperature is lower than the room temperature. And this temperature is selected such that it is higher than the outside temperature. So the, the operation, we call them the operational criteria for selecting the refrigerant. So when we talk about refrigeration in the HVAC heating, ventilation, and air conditioning industry, we use ton of refrigeration or TOR is used as a cooling unit. And this is the amount of heat that's being absorbed. And this is because in the old days, refrigeration was limited to ice production. When refrigerants were so, so much expensive, so people would just produce ice and then the ice could be used for the cooling and freezing uh, purposes. So one ton is the amount of cooling or heat removed needed to produce one ton of ice in 24 hours. And of course, by using the heat of vaporization at zero degrees C, then we can convert ton to kilowatts. So one ton corresponds to 3.516 kilowatt, and that's equivalent to 12,000 rich thermal unit, uh, basically per hour. Of course, this is industrial, or this is the market unit. We always do the calculation using kilowatt, but then at the very end, I need to convert the kilowatts into tons, and then I need to convert them maybe to the nearest 0.5 in order to, in order, in order to find a suitable uh, air conditioner in the market. The working fluid used in air conditioning, of course, as you all know, it's uh, the, uh, we call it refrigerants. Refrigerants have superior thermodynamic properties that make them suitable for cooling uh, processes. Are most commonly used groups of refrigerants, we know them being uh, chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, ammonia, hydrocarbons like propane, ethane, ethylene, carbon dioxide, air like in the aircraft, and even water can be used as a refrigerant in some uh, applications. 
commonly used refrigerants R11, R12, R22, R134A, and R 502 uh, Many of these refrigerants now are being replaced, like for instance, in domestic refrigerators. Uh, in the past days, they used to use refrigerant 12, now it's being converted, use, uh, now we use R134A and uh, R22 being used for domestic uses now, uh, basically is being phased out and 410 is being uh, used in order to basically, uh, for, for, uh, uh, to, in order to save the environment basically from uh, the environment uh, harming uh, refrigerants. The industrial and heavy commercial sectors can use ammonia. And ammonia is basically toxic, uh, poisonous basically, and hence it cannot be used for non-food human applications. R11 is used in large capacity water chillers. When we basically circulate cold water instead of basically uh, using uh, sibling units. R134A, as I said, uh, which replaced R12, that damages the ozone layer now is being used most commonly for domestic refrigerators and for automotive air conditioners. The size of the air conditioner is decided by the cooling load. And of course, basically some of you or maybe all of you must have attended a cooling load calculation. And this is of course by itself requires a whole course on how to calculate the load and uh, based on that load calculated, you will get the kilowatt of heat removal that needs to basically uh, be provided. Then you convert those kilowatts into ton of cooling and then you go to the market to select the proper air conditioner size. The cooling load is the amount of heat to be removed, as I said, from the space to be cooled and the cooling load is calculated separately. And based on that, you select the air conditioner with the given tons of refrigeration. Cooling load decides the size of the air conditioner. Cooling load mainly depends on the heat coming from, here I'm talking about uh, domestic uses from occupants, people in the space. And of course, when it comes to the uh, occupants, you need to um, think of the size of the people. Do I have, for instance, a school where I have uh, small kids? Do I have, uh, for instance, like grown up adults? And also you need to check their activity. Of course, if for instance, it's a hotel, then people most time they are either sitting or sleeping. Then in that case, of course, the amount of heat dissipated from people is not going to be as much as when I design a near conditioner to be used inside a gymnasium. Why? Because inside the gym, people are basically working out and they basically produce so much heat. Uh, to, to find the amount of heat being produced based on the activity, you need to go back to one of the handbooks, like Ashery handbooks. Lighting and equipment. Do I need to design the system for a computer lab, for instance? Then in that case, I also need to consider the, the heat that comes from the computers. And of course, also we have the heat that comes from the outside. In areas like my area here in Oman, uh, this is this takes uh, basically this is the most significant part. This is the heat that comes through the walls, and in this case, I need to do this calculation in kilowatt, and that's why we need to do this calculation on hourly basis. So I need to go hour by hour, and I need to do this calculation for eight thousand seven hundred sixty hours which is basically 365 days multiplied by 24 hours per day. And when it comes to cooling load calculation, we need to consider the occupancy of the place. Like for instance, if you are doing this for a school, then in that case, of course, you don't want to calculate occupancy for night hours. Lighting and equipment, they are operational during the working hours, but they are off during the off hours. Heat gain from the outside, in this case, of course, you need what we call the typical meteorological year for the given place. The typical meteor meteorological year is going to give you the dry bulb temperature, going to give you the humidity, and it's going to give you solar radiation. And usually for this, we have, again, 8,760 hours. So for each hour, for each typical hour of the year, 
you have a cooling load. And the cooling load is being provided in kilowatts. And then you need to decide, you, do you need to design a system that is going to be uh, efficient to cover 8,760 hours of the year? That means you need to go and check the highest kilowatt reading throughout the 8,760 calculations. Sometimes we don't have to satisfy all of these hours. We, we might need to satisfy 95% of them. Then in that case, we don't have to go to the maximum kilowatt calculation uh, in, in, in our table. But we need to satisfy, we need to basically sort them out from the highest to the lowest. And then we need to go to the point where we are satisfying 95% of the hours throughout the year. Of course, people uh, use different protocols. Um, I know one firm here is used, uh, which use 97.5%. That means 22.5% of the hours per year. You, you, uh, even when the AC is working at full load, still you are not going to feel comfortable inside the room because it's not heating well. So that depends on the economy later on. Of course, sometimes we don't want to spend for uh, five tons of cooling when we don't need to have five tons of cooling throughout the year, but we need less for most of it. So like I said, again, uh, I saw also one course in this platform where uh, basically cooling calculation uh, basically is being given. Now, when we talk about the efficiency of the cycle, we need to consider the first law of thermodynamics. Energy, either in both forms, heat or work, cannot be created nor can it be destroyed. Energy into and out of the refrigerant cycle has to be balanced. So what do we have in the cycle? I absorb heat from the room, that's QL that goes into my cycle. I need to add electricity to the, to the cycle, work. And I need to dispose of heat at the condenser size, side. And so in that case, if I look at this cycle, then the heat absorbed plus the power input to the compressor equals to the heat being disposed of at the condenser size. In using the SI system, energy is calculated in the units of joule and it's multiples like kilojoule, megajoule, and power is basically the rate of energy transfer per unit time. And for that, we use joule per second, which is what? And then we express, uh, express the figures in SI units in multiples of watts, like kilowatts and megawatts. One ton of refrigeration is equivalent to 3.516 kilowatts. And we need to do this conversion when we get the cooling load in kilowatt converted into tons. When we talk about the performance of the air conditioner, we use the coefficient of performance. And it is basically the efficiency, the efficiency of air conditioner. It's the efficiency of air conditioners uh, and it's expressed as coefficient performance. We don't like to use efficiency because efficiency, we have that basically conventional range of efficiency, efficiency that goes from 0% to 100%, but because in this case, uh, COB can be greater than one. I think here's a mistake here, we should, oh no, this is fine. Here we have QL divided by the power input. Here we have the heat to be removed. This is our output, this is our desired output. Here's our required input. So here we have the power that needs to be consumed. And so we have QL divided by power input. And this can be greater than one. That's why we use the term coefficient of performance rather than using uh, efficiency. One very important thing that will lead us to talking about dual heat pumps is that COB decreases with decreasing cooling temperature. So it's always not so economical to cool a space to a lower temperature than needed, because at that point, COB is going to drop. COB is always, 
inversely proportional, proportional with the difference between the high temperature and the low temperature. When I say the high temperature, I'm talking about the condenser size, side and low temperature, I'm talking about the evaporator side. When this range is small, then in that case, COB is going to increase. We also have energy efficiency rating or EER. And this is the amount of heat removed from the cooled space in BTU for one kilowatt hour of electricity. So here we're comparing BTU to one watt per hour or how much cooling we remove from the space per power input. So this is one expression, which is EER. And if I convert it to COB, then one EER is equivalent to 3.412 COB. In COB, we use same units. I can either use BTU per watt hour or I can use kilowatt and kilowatt for both, for the heat removed QL and for the power input to the compressor. I use kilowatt and kilowatt or BTU per hour and BTU per hour. But usually we use kilowatt because of course here we're talking about electricity. In EER, we use BTU per watt per hour by using this conversion equation. And it's very common in the United States when you go and buy a building, uh, basically you will find the EER for that building. They are basically telling you about the efficiency of the air conditioner being used in that building. Because when I go to a building, I cannot tell about the efficiency of the air conditioner. Yes, I see it very cold, but maybe because the air conditioner is being oversized. It doesn't mean that the air conditioner is uh, basically efficient. I need to make sure from, from this reading, either the EER or the COB basically. Now, what is the difference between heat pumps and air conditioners? You can always think of heat pumps as reverse air conditioner. In the air conditioner, we basically have the cooling mode where we go from the compressor to the condenser, to the expansion valve, and then to the evaporator. While in the heat pump, it is reversed. Now it goes from the compressor, it goes to the condenser, and the condenser in this case is inside. And we have the evaporator in the outside. The same operation. The only difference in this case is that we have a different refrigerant and we select the pressure uh, values or the pressure limits such that I will allow a pressure value inside the room whose boiling point is higher than the desired temperature. So I will make sure that heat is going to flow in this case from the condenser to the inside of the room. And at the outside of the room, I need to make sure that my pressure here is going to be at a value whose boiling temperature is less than the surrounding so that heat is going to be taken from the outside into the evaporator. It's the same process. And the most common energy source for heat pumps is atmospheric air. If atmospheric air is so cold, then we have other renewable sources like for instance, geothermal energy, where we basically have the uh, evaporator side that goes deep into the ground and we basically take the heat from the underground. Both the capacity and the efficiency of a heat pump fall significantly at low temperature. Therefore, most air source heat pumps require a supplementary heating system as electric uh, resistance heaters or gas furnace. And this is the reason why we need to go for dual heat pump. I'll talk in a minute about the coefficient of performance for heat pumps and air conditioners. And we are going to see the impact of increasing difference between low temperature and high temperature and how would that impact the COB and why we need to have another source for auxiliary heating. Heat pumps are most competitive in areas that have a large cooling load during the cooling season and a relatively small heating load during the heating season. And in this region, 
uh, or in these uh, areas, the heat pump can meet the entire cooling and heating needs for residential or commercial uh, buildings. So this is again very dependent on the, uh, the, the place you are in. You need to check the atmospheric temperature range and the desired cooling or heating range. So the refrigeration cycle as a generic name, is the primary cycle using, used for heat pumps used for heating and air conditioners used for cooling. Only difference between these two is the direction of flow. With the heat pumps, we have the condenser inside the room. With the air conditioners, we have the evaporator inside the room. So we are basically reversing the cycle. And then we have to select the refrigerants in such a way that would match the desired temperatures. And of course, within an acceptable range of pressure values. Coefficient of performance is desired output divided by required input. For the air conditioner, my desired output is cooling. So in that case, I have Q.C. That means the heat removed at the low temperature side divided by work input to the compressor. And from the fact that Q.H. equals W plus Q.C., I can express W as QH minus QC. This is the actual coefficient of performance. From the second law of thermodynamics, theoretically, what would be the maximum possible coefficient of performance? I'm not going to go into the derivation of this concept, but we replace QC by the cold temperature side, the evaporator temperature side we replace QH by the high temperature side or TH. And in that case, there is no way, according to the second law of thermodynamics, there is no way that my COB can be better than the ideal COB, which we call cannot cycle or reverse cannot cycle COB. There is no way for a given situation where I have the condenser side at TH, and I have the evaporator side at uh, TC, there is no way that COB can be better than COB maximum, which is TC divided by TH minus TC. For a given air conditioner, TC is basically the room temperature, and TH is basically the outside temperature. This is very important. Why? Because sometimes I need to calibrate an air conditioner. Now I mean, I'm, I'm not using efficiency. So I'm not, I cannot compare it to 100%. When I look at the COB, I cannot compare it to 100%. Why? Because I have these figures always greater than one, but I can compare the actual to the maximum possible. And I look at the margin between them. If you notice that this COB max will increase when TH minus TC increases. So when this difference, difference increase, COB is going to drop to one. What happens if this COB drops to one? One is very low, extremely low. What happens in that case, I will have desired output being the same as required input. This is very significant when it comes to the heat pump. What happens in the heat pump? In the heat pump, my desired output now is no longer QH, it is QH, uh, no longer QL, it is QH. What I have inside the room now is the condenser. I am trying to condense the refrigerant so that it will basically 
release heat to the room. And likewise, I can express these values with their temp corresponding temperatures to get the maximum possible coefficient of performance for the heat pump. And again, I have the same ob uh, uh, observation here, is that this COB is going to drop down when TH minus TC increases. As TH minus TC goes very high, COB is going to approach unity, is going to be one. What does that mean? It, it means in this case, the desired output is the same as the required input. That means QH is going to be the same as WN. That means the performance of the heat pump in this case is going to be equivalent to electrical heating. In this case, I don't want to use an electrical heater. Then it's better for me to use a primary heater. That means I need to use a furnace. I need to burn some fuel. And at this point, I can basically switch from a heat pump to a furnace. And this is my system, that's my, my dual system basically, where I need to decide that my heat pump is not the best option. Now I need to switch to a furnace. So the two expressions of the COB, as I said, the actual and the maximum, tell us two important things about the COB is that by decreasing work input, COB, this is missing, COB increases. When I have less work input, COB will increase. So that means I need to use an efficient compressor. By decreasing the temperature difference, COB also increases. How can I make use of this? I always need to keep my set point not to the lowest, but to arrange that is comfortable enough. I don't have to set it down to 17 degrees C. I can put it somewhere between 20 and 22, that will be fine. Or even 25 if possible. That's going to increase my COB. That's going to be more energy saving. So from here, hence when outside temperature for the sake of the heat pump is extremely cold, heat pumps will have small efficiency, COB. Likewise, when the outside temperature is very hot, the efficiency of the air conditioner becomes very low. When the outside temperature is very low, that means very cold, let's say it is minus 20 degrees C or minus 10 degrees C. COB for the heat pump approaches one. It goes to one. Why is that? Because if we find the limit, let's say go to some basic math. If I take the limit of this as TH goes to infinity, if I divide this by TH, I divide this by TH, and I divide this by TH, then this is going to be one, this is going to be one. And as TH goes to a very high number, then this will approach zero. That means I have the limit one divided by one minus zero. It's not going to be one exactly one, but it's going to be one point something. That means at that point, what will happen? Electrical heating will be the same as using a heat pump. But electrical heating is not the best option if I can use a primary fuel like natural gas or like propane, if I can use a furnace. So I might not have the best option. I might not have the best uh, basically choice. Instead of using a heat pump in that case, I can switch to a furnace. And so in that case, I will have a dual system, a heat pump and a furnace. What happens in this case is that I have a sensor that will sense the outside temperature 
And if the difference is going to take my COB to almost one, then at that point, I have to switch to the furnace because at that point, furnace is going to be more efficient than using the heat pump. This is very useful in situations where I have mild uh, cold weather as compared to extreme cold weather. So in regions where season swing between extreme cold and mildly cold, instead of depending only on the heat pump, I can use, utilize basically the dual system. Then the heat pump at that point is going to be useful as long as the outside temperature is greater than 35 degrees Fahrenheit or about two degrees C. When the outside temperature drop far below this figure, then in that case, I should use the furnace. I need to use a primary fuel as a source of heating. It's going to be more uh, basically economical than using a heat pump because when I use the heat pump, I'm going to use electricity at an efficiency, not as much as using the furnace. This dual operation offers more efficiency and better heating economy than using a heat pump alone or a furnace alone, because when I use a furnace alone, maybe at some points I could just simply use little electricity and by this swabbing of the cycle between uh, basically removing the heat from the outside, take it to, taking it to the inside, be more economical than basically burning fuel. Provided that that COB is high enough, greater than let's say three, for instance. But when it's close to one, then electrical, it's almost working like an electrical heater. That's why I need to switch to primary fuel. When we look at the uh, cost of dual heat pumps, they cost 20 to 25% more than compared to the conventional system. Uh, but uh, usually this price can be paid back in a period of five to six years. So there is some saving in it and it's more basically environment friendly. So here is my system. Usually I have a furnace. I have my typical heat pump. So here at this point, I have my condenser. Here I have my evaporator. Heat is being removed from the outside through the evaporator. Then it's being compressed to the inside. Then heat is being released to the, to the inside. When the temperature is sensed to be less than zero degrees C or so, then at that point, I have to switch on the furnace. And so I will have this exaggerated. So I will have the heating effect comes from the furnace instead of basically coming from the outside air to be more economical. So that's, that's basically uh, the, the, the uh, principle of dual heat pumps. And it's very important when these components are quite obvious, but when it comes to the selection of the refrigerants, we have some common conventional criteria like we need to care about the toxicity level, the non-flammability, we have to uh, uh, basically uh, check the uh, ozone depletion potential for 